From the high desert of Boulder, Colorado, a mutant nexus at the base of the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, about a mile above the sea level portion of the Babylon Matrix, where we are nestled just beneath the beautiful Flatiron Mountains, this is Jonathan Zapp of ZappOracle.com, and welcome to the podcast recording of When Is a Void Not a Void? Enter, Enter the Void, a sort of review of Enter the Void. And this is uh, February 8th of 2011, and I wrote this about a day ago. This sort of review of Enter the Void is for people who have seen the film. If you haven't seen the film, do it right. Blu-ray, surround sound, 32-inch minimum size, 1080p screen, nighttime, fairly empty stomach, and whatever else you would do to prepare yourself for a life-changing vision that will be both eerily beautiful and traumatic. In the past, some people have been disdainful of my insistence on quality equipment and have characterized it as an indulgence in consumerism and gadget obsession. But you wouldn't want to hear a Beethoven symphony for the first time via the speaker of a cell phone, would you? Would you want to have sex for the first time while wearing 50 condoms? Sensory impact is crucial, and this movie was intended to have sensory impact. Without gadgets, there are no movies, and without the right gadgets, Movies have insufficient sensory impact. Watch the film in the right conditions or wait until you can find them. Just watching on a netbook or other undersized screen. And I'm, I'm going to take a tangent off the text for a second to, to emphasize this. Some people say it's financially elitist. Right now, I happen to have good equipment. For a long time, I was living in an 18-foot RV. And sometimes that meant having to watch a movie on a 15 by four diagonally measured laptop screen, which was the absolute minimum. But under those circumstances, I could still kind of make it right with a good pair of headphones, not the computers, not the laptop speakers, that would be ridiculous. And then I would prop the laptop up on like several books to bring the screen to eye level and then sit really close to that screen because you just don't get the psychological impact Um, if the screen is too small. And so I think it's ideal that your screen be big enough that on close-up, a a face, a human face on the screen is at least life-size. So for home viewing, a 32-inch screen is, is pretty adequate if you're sitting pretty close to it so that it's sort of like you're sitting across from a person who in close-up is about the same size that you are. Okay, so this is not in any conventional sense a movie review. You can find everything you need to know about how Enter the Void was made, the director's intentions, etc. online. Also, let's make this plain from the outset. I have never agreed with the foolish idea that the meaning of a work of art is reducible to the artist's intentions. Some people find out what a director, for example, intended to mean by an aspect of his film and then take that as definitive and consider any other interpretation to be misinformed or merely a projection. Especially with visionary art, it is quite common that the artist does not consciously comprehend all the possible levels of meaning embedded in his work. It is also very common that the artist's waking attitude causes him to have limited or distorted views of what he has created. By the way, this is another tangent. Uh, Some people will hear my use of he and him as if I'm suggesting that only film directors are masculine. This is always a frustrating thing for me because I've written many things saying there and they, and my editor, Austin Iredale, has relentlessly corrected that as uh, improper English. Um, And that's sort of correct. We just have not come up with a neuter pronoun it gets tiresome to say he and she. It starts to seem contrived to like switch to she. The default has been to use the masculine pronoun. I wish that weren't the case, but that's what I've been doing with uh, my writings. I hope somebody is able to correct that one day. Visionary surreal art also invites projection, and projections may discover, amplify, and extend meanings that go beyond the artist's conscious intentions. For myself, I found that just as new layers of meaning may emerge from one of my dreams, I think I've already interpreted, so too with photos I've taken, various things I've written. Layers of meaning may be discovered later by myself or others that appropriately go beyond my original conscious intentions. 
One artist who understands this is David Lynch. In some of the extras on the DVDs of Twin Peaks, um, Fire Walk With Me, Michael J. Anderson, who plays the dwarf in a red suit, the man from another place, mentions a moment where David Lynch, during the course of filming a scene, says something like, so that's why I did blank. Lynch was referring to something in an earlier scene already filmed. Anderson found it mind-blowing that Lynch was discovering after the fact why he did something, but I don't find that surprising at all. Gaspar Noe, the director genius behind Enter the Void, has the worldview you would expect from a French filmmaker, atheist, existentialist, postmodernist, bleak materialist, with a stereotypical grim, void view of human existence, etc., Inevitably, his conscious view of his film has to work within the box of that silly, archaic, depressive Welton trying. But the film itself has depths that go light years and dimensions beyond the little postmodernist box, which is a container too laughably small to contain any encompassing vision of human existence. Okay, so now that I have firmly established myself as a greater authority on Gaspar Noe's film and Gaspar Noe, we can take off Jean-Paul Sartre's myopic spectacles and enter, enter the void, where we will discover that there isn't a void, of course, but many layers of priceless content rich with meanings. But now I feel like I've exhausted myself with the need for all those preliminaries. The sun is starting to come up, and I feel like, I, I, and I like to write pre-dawn and no longer have the mental energy to figure out how to write about this film in any organized way. And that's exactly what was going on in me 48 hours ago. I just got done writing all those preliminaries and found like I just didn't have the energy to continue to be so uh, logical and organized, I guess. Um, but since the film is nonlinear and surreal anyway, maybe I'll just void the organization and allow myself to rapidly fly above and through my flickering memories of the film, flash back to various thoughts, projections, and meanings that sparked in my mind when I saw it, and take the first-person point of view in the film you might expect from someone who has very recently ingested a fatal bullet from a Japanese policeman's handgun, a very potent single-use hallucinogen, though you should always consult with your physician before imbibing Japanese police handgun bullets, red but not blue capsules, or any other such potent mood-altering substances. I'm inside my tiny Tokyo apartment, irradiated by iridescent neon lights coming through sliding glass balcony doors. The horrible burnt ping-pong ball taste of DMT is searing my 20-year-old lungs, and suddenly, rupture of plane, rupture of plane! I'm falling into through the DMT-verse, and into hyperdimensional lattices of Celtically interwoven triple helix wormhole sorts of things, and I'm smoking enough DMT to kill half a dozen Terence McKenna's, but can still deal with a cool Neo Tokyo cell phone. I'm liminal, liminal, liminal zone. I'm an adolescent, I'm an American, but I live in neon, almost extraterrestrial Tokyo, so I'm between and betwixt, between and betwixt on every level, childhood, adulthood, stone straight, life, death. I'm phasing in and out of the DMT-verse and the edible tragedy I'm playing out with my fellow mammals. I'm intensely alive and young, but hurtling toward imminent death. I'm a metamorphosing mammal, and I'm driven by sex, breasts, licking and sucking, suckling as an infant, the body of another mammal, my first food source playing out primal energies and raw emotions and messy dramas with other mammals, promises and betrayals, seductions, corruptions, exploitations, a flickering, fugitive life, and I'm shot, I'm shot, shot dead in the toilet, and now I'm rising and expanding, and I'm a kaleidoscopic revelation of cascading primal mammalian moments, raw emotion, violence, orgasm, birth, death, and now I can go anywhere and see into any facet of the traumatic, eerily beautiful phantasmagoria of my mammalian incarnation and all the mammalian timelines extending off of it. And I see the primal energies exchanged between mammals. I see that casual sex was a complete delusion because it is a merging of primal essential energies and what seemed casual is interwoven with tragic magic and death. I was an edible mammalian boy looking for mama's breast, 
seeking to return to the womb through DMT and mammalian sex tragedy. And wherever I see far from equilibrium dissipative structures like the gas jets in Victor's apartment or a vortex of water spiraling down a drain, I am drawn in, pulled toward all such dynamic structures. They are like irresistible orifices that my Oedipal mammalian passions are drawn to with savage magnetism because they are microcosms of what I am, what any mammal or disembodied spirit is. For we are all far from equilibrium dissipative structures, and these far from equilibrium dissipative orifices are portals, portals through death and the DMT verse. And I'm seeing that everything is inside, inside, and the deeper in you go, the bigger it gets. And everything I thought I saw when I was a foolish living mammal was a neurological construct. And there is no single reference reality. There is a kaleidoscopic cascade of myriad realities. And in one of them, this weird French guy is making a movie about me. But why the fuck is he talking about a void? There's no void. There is an explosion of content, more than I could ever have imagined when I was Oedipal Mammal Boy. And these dramas and tragedies I sleepwalked through, there was so much at stake, so much more meaning and feeling than I ever realized. And me and all my friends and this French guy didn't get it. Sex isn't a casual pleasure or exploitive opportunity. It's alchemical and life-changing. How could we have been so blind? Why didn't we realize that blinded sex is Oedipal tragic magic? Why didn't we realize what was at stake? What was at stake in life? Why did we live inside the neon cage of the mammalian sex hotel? Inside the sex hotel, inside every room, primal energies and tragic magic alchemy going on, but they don't know it. Don't know. They think they are just any mammal, but they are not just any mammal. They are the most interior of mammals, and interiority is where the whole life force of the planet was going, from slime to cephalization, when organisms started to have heads and therefore interior space, the inner neurological simulacrum of the outer, and that drive led up to human beings, and our birth hurt the woman so much so that we could have bigger heads, so we could be more interior, more self-aware. And that led to the French guy, to a movie where everything is inside my head, where everything that seems outer is inner. And that's the main drive of evolution. Only the French guy didn't get it. The guy with the alchemical website, rocking back and forth in his chair, channeling me, he gets it. There is no void. There is an explosion of interior content. Why does Gaspar think he needs actors and sets and lights and dialogues and CGI if there is a void? It's the opposite of a void. Wake up, Gaspar. Wake up and don't smell the dismal cappuccino of French existentialism. Wake up and smell the explosion of novelty you've evoked in your film. How could you call that a void? Spending time in the mammalian sex hotel can make you feel like a void. But ultimate reality is an explosion of content and meaning. But it's okay. It's okay, Gaspar. I forgive you, Gaspar, for not knowing what you yourself have wrought. Because I didn't know either. Didn't realize what was at stake. These were moments when I, there were moments when I almost knew, when I said to Linda that it would be good to have a goal. But we didn't have goals. I was edible mammal boy and didn't have access to the higher masculine. Was just adrift in the carnival of lost souls with other mammals who also didn't know their higher nature. And now I see that there are secrets here, secrets in the neon sex hotel. I know I've seen this hotel before. Where have I seen it before? Oh my God, my God, I know where I've seen it before. This was a model, a fluorescent painted model that glowed phosphorescently under the black lights when Alex and his friend showed it to me. And, and that means that I have created the sex hotel here, created it out of the product of someone else's imagination and that means, that means I am the opposite of a void. I am a sub-creator, a sub-creator, a weaver of realities, a sub-creator. And now I can go, I can phase out of this neon movie if I want. And I can go then because there are other worlds than these. My interest in writing about the psyche leaving the body at death didn't begin with picking on Gaspar, no. I wrote two such pieces 25 years ago. One, a brief experimental piece I wrote while I was in the NYU graduate creative writing program. 
and that's called Carter. These are linked on the site, and I'm going to do podcasts of them as well. The other one, Johnny, is much more Enter the Void-like in that it is a montage of flashbacks experienced by a fatally wounded inner-city kid. It was also written in the 80s when I knew a lot about that subject as I was teaching in the South Bronx. This place and time was ground zero for the hip-hop explosion. Grandmaster Flash came from my high school, and I was especially close to some of the more talented graffiti writers. I knew Keith Haring, and the Fun Gallery was right across the street from where I lived in the East Village, so I was able to help some of them uh, some get their work shown, some of the young graffiti writers I knew, in other words. This story was published in, in Longshot, a literary journal edited by my friend and fellow teacher in the South Bronx, Danny Schott. Allen Ginsberg, who lived a block away in the East Village, was a contributor. He has a poem on the conduct of the world seeking beauty against government in the very issue that Johnny was in, Volume 6. Finally, I borrowed the phrase tragic magic from my friend Rob Brezhny, who has written the definitive counterpole to the stagnant, only dark is good postmodernist view. And that review is also linked at the bottom of the article. And Pronoia is the antidote for paranoia, how the whole world is conspiring to shower you with blessings. And you can read my review of that, which is called, Is the World Spiraling Toward You Catastrophe, or Is That Just My Pronoia? And the link is on the bottom of the page. Thank you for joining me for this podcast. This is Jonathan Zapp of zapporacle.com, signing off.